This is going to finish up 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to look at the subject of, can't we all just get along? So in 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So Paul's prayer is that they forget minor differences, and like I'm saying, minor differences, and quit dividing over these minor things. However, there are times to divide in the Bible. It says in Luke 12, 51, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. That's the Lord Jesus Christ talking. Because the Lord knew the truth would divide. And we can't just divide over the minor differences, but there are some things to divide over. But can't we all get along for the most part as Bible-believing Christians? That's what I'm talking about. Having unity among Bible believers. It says in Romans 12, 9 through 10, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So Paul is beseeching them or begging them in the name of Jesus Christ to not be divided. Now there are times when Paul even will say you need to divide. However, he doesn't want it to be over something little. He says to speak the same thing. The way a local church can do this is to speak the oracles of God. If we know that we're all going to speak the same thing, then make sure that what we're saying comes straight from the Bible. And that's our final authority, the King James Bible. It says in 1 Peter 4.11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God are what God said. It is the words of God. If a group of believers can decide that the Bible will be the final authority, then they will all be of the same mind. They will have their minor differences, but where it matters, they will be in agreement. Give people freedom on the minor things, but when it comes to major things, we need to be in agreement. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 15 says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So some traditions are biblical traditions that we don't need to give up. Now Paul is all about Bible-believing Christians joining together. Not for all religions joining together. He's not ecumenical. He doesn't think everyone is a child of God. He wouldn't be for Baptists getting with the Pentecostals and all this stuff as some of the popular evangelists are for today because... You know, the Pentecostals, the Church of Christ, they're teaching some pretty big heresies, and we don't want to, you know, have fellowship with someone who's adding, plainly adding works to the gospel. He doesn't believe it's okay for a Christian to go party and smoke pot and get drunk and, you know, listen to techno music at r raves. He doesn't want us, you know, hanging out with worldly Christians either. He doesn't want you to join up with the world. He wants you to join up with other Bible-believing Christians who believe what the Bible says, and you guys are in agreement on probably 95% of things. And 1 Corinthians 1.11 says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So if you are earnestly contending for the faith, then there shouldn't be contentions among you and other believers. If you're concerned about doing things for the Lord and your mind and your motive is for the Lord, then there shouldn't be contentions among you. If you have the same gospel preaching the same Jesus and the same Bible and your goal is to get people saved and not to look good yourself, then why would you be at each other's throats? It says in Luke nine forty nine through 50, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. If you're shooting down other men that belong to God and are doing the right thing, then that's like a ball player tripping up his own teammate. That's like a soldier shooting his fellow soldier. We should all just get along so we can earnestly contend for the faith and not contend and have contentions with each other. 
Jude 1, 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So it's more beneficial to spread the gospel, teach the Bible verse by verse, edify each other, be good to each other, pray for each other, pray about the souls of men. It's more beneficial to do that than it is to fight and complain about minor doctrines all the time. And some people's whole ministry is to fight and complain about doctrine. That is almost all you see anymore. And it is because of envy and it's because of strife. And Paul says in Philippians 1, 15 and 16, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So when you preach the gospel that way, when you preach it of envy and strife and about make it about contention, then you just make it harder on the real Bible believers who are trying to preach the gospel and trying to get lost people saved because you're killing their rep. You're ruining their rep. Uh, one week, they people you have people arguing about the Godhead. One week, they argue about baptism. And that can be a good thing to argue about. If you're arguing against someone saying, you know, baptism saves because baptism doesn't save, but you have Bible believers who are arguing on whether or not we should get baptized today. One week they argue about church buildings, and then they make salvation based on whether or not you believe on the same way that they believe. And they are so quick to say the words unsaved and the word heretic. They're quick to call people lost and they're quick to call people heretics and many times there are contentions and divisions because men get mad at other men for not following the men that they follow there's all types of groups and sects and camps of of preachers and i just listen to all of them i listen to all the teachers and all the preachers if you know they're king james and they got the right gospel but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 13, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Christ isn't divided. Paul wasn't crucified for them. And they were baptized in the name of Christ, not Paul. Paul didn't want any part of the division. He wasn't looking for a following. So he didn't want people saying, I am of Paul. So he says in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. He's glad he didn't baptize them, not because baptism is wrong, not because it isn't for today, but because he doesn't want any of them saying he baptized in his own name like they were doing. You have men who break fellowship with you because of the man you follow. And it's okay to follow a man, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You can follow a man if he follows Christ. Everybody follows somebody. Some men follow their own personal pastor in their town, which is fine as long as he follows Christ. Some men follow men who have already passed on, like Harold Seitler or J. Vernon McGee or Clarence Larkin or Peter Ruckman. Some men follow... Ralph Sexton Jr. Some men follow Stephen Anderson. Some men follow uh, Robert Breaker. It's okay to follow a man. It's not okay to break fellowship with someone who isn't following and parroting the person that you follow. Follow a man as long as he is going down the right road. And you can follow men from all the different camps as long as you know they're not teaching major false doctrine. But 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So God has men who study and labor in the word. And he makes it clear he wants you to follow certain men. Paul said to Timothy, or Paul said to Titus in Titus 1.5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So now if God didn't want you to have any influence by men, then why does he ordain elders? Why did he give pastors and evangelists? Sometimes someone tries to sound all spiritual and say that I don't follow men, I only follow Christ. 
and you know you say do you know any good you know study bibles or study helps they'll say yeah the king james bible or something like that you know trying to sound all spiritual like you know they don't use study helps or commentaries they just got the bible and that's all they need but if you're really following Christ, then you can follow men. Because Paul says in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Isn't it funny how the men who say you shouldn't follow a man want you to follow them? They say, don't read any study Bibles or commentaries, yet they want you to listen to them teach and to them preach. And they have every sermon that they've ever preached in their entire life on the internet for you to have easy access to every time they go to the mailbox or go to the bathroom and they write everything down on Facebook so you can follow every part of their life. Yet they're telling you, don't follow a man, but they want you to follow them. They want you to follow them. It sounds like they just want you to be questioning them. They don't want you to challenge them or don't you want you to be revealed to the truth because some other man out there goes against what they teach. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 14 and 15, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. So Paul is glad he didn't baptize any of them because he didn't want to be a part of that division. He didn't want them saying, I'm of Paul. Paul baptized me. So Paul has a burden for the Gentiles. He had an even greater burden for his kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jews. So he would rather earnestly contend for the faith by preaching the book, getting converts, and the main things. He wants to stick with the main things rather than just constantly contending with someone about doctrine. But if you preach the Bible and you preach doctrine, then you know, you're going to cause some divisions. There's going to be divisions there over doctrine. If Paul was here today, he would probably say, can't we all just get along? But when it comes to false teachers and heretics, he would say, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. And that is what he would say about the Church of Christ cult, who teaches baptismal regeneration. 1 Corinthians 1, 16 and 17 says, And I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So the fact that Paul says, I came not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, shows that baptism isn't part of the gospel. It shows water baptism doesn't save, yet Paul did baptize some, showing that water baptism is still for today. But Paul is an evangelist, not a pastor. When an evangelist comes to your church and someone gets saved, who usually baptizes the convert? The pastor of the church, not the evangelist. Paul is just saying Christ sent him to preach the gospel, and his main thing isn't baptism. So if baptism saves, then... You know, Paul would say, I came to baptize, and he would make that a part of the gospel, but he didn't. And if baptism weren't for today, then he wouldn't have said, I baptize some of you. But 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So if you preach the gospel with wisdom of words, then you are making it of none effect, because it is a simple gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now someone we can't get along with is someone who corrupts the gospel. And Galatians 1, 8 through 9 shows us how they're accursed. It says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is simple. He died. Everyone understands that. He died by shedding his blood. He died for your sins. Do you understand you have sinned against God just by telling a lie? He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. That means he didn't stay dead. He got up. It's a simple gospel. And all you have to do to be saved is 
trust in Jesus Christ and what He did for you on the cross to be your payment for your sins. But don't preach the cross with wisdom of words. Don't try to make people think that you are smart. Don't use big words all the time. Don't try to get glory for all the knowledge that you've compiled in your brain. Because your brain... You're not that smart anyway. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. When a man is preaching, he can look foolish. But the preaching of the cross is the power of God. That's why you shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You hear many preachers talk about how Talk about having power when they preach. And this is how has nothing to do with how loud they preach or their rhythm or their technique. It's about, are you preaching the cross? Do you have the right gospel? Are you preaching the words of God from the right Bible and not with wisdom of words? Because the average man isn't concerned with how smart you are. He doesn't think you're cool or something because you know all this stuff about the Bible. The average man doesn't think that way. But he will respond to the preaching of the cross because it's the power of God. The Lord is looking for a man to preach where the common man can understand him. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven says, But God hath chosen the foolish chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The message of the cross isn't foolish, but the people preaching can look foolish. I've heard people say about a street preacher, what is this crazy guy doing? Because they think it's foolish. 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 20 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Paul says, where is the wise men and the scribes and the disputers of this world? That is, the smart guys who think they know everything to a point that they believe they can correct what the Lord said in his Bible. And I just can't get along with someone who constantly corrects the Bible. I don't like when someone corrects the Bible. I'm not saying you should be mean to them, but I wouldn't get my doctrine from them. 1 Corinthians one twenty one says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God uses unlearned and ignorant men many times to make the wise men of this world look like fools. For example, I've witnessed to men that are much older and way smarter and more educated than me. The Lord used a fool, an unlearned, and ignorant man to give a wise man the gospel. I didn't even graduate high school, but there are men who I have witnessed to with degrees who didn't, who didn't even know how to be saved. Way smarter than me, much more advanced than me in pretty every aspect of life, but they don't know how to be saved. Uh, my daughter is three years old and knows more about Jesus Christ than someone like her pediatrician. She could tell her doctor how to be str saved, but... Her doctor couldn't tell her how to be saved. Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Some people are so smart, and yet at the same time so unwise and a complete idiot in spiritual matters. They know how to perform a surgery on someone, and yet they don't know where their soul is going when they die. 2 Timothy 3, 7 says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's true for so many people. They know a lot of facts. They know everything about everything, but yet they don't know how to get to heaven. They don't know if they're going to heaven. But this has been 1 Corinthians, the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we've looked at the subject, can't we all just get along? Can't you get along with other people who believe the same Bible, have the same gospel, but disagree on little minor things like prophecy and things like that. Can't you get along with that person?